Brenna let me know she was hoping to join us and she got an assignment, something she has to do. She found out today and it's due tomorrow. And okay. I said, oh, how nice. So, so she's stuck and can't come. But um, we will have the recording for her and for anybody else who wasn't able to make it. Okay, something popped up on my screen and I don't know how to get rid of it. Uh, uh -oh. It should be a little, it's, it's, I got it. It should be a little orange button that you want to touch. Oh, I Some color button down there that it, it's telling you that it's being recorded. Right. Well, how do you get rid of it? Just put your cursor on it and, and tap it. Click it. Oh, I have the work. Okay. Got it. Got it. I got it. Ah, I, didn't, teamwork. I didn't scroll down enough. Sally always does that stuff, and I don't well, know. Think of all <laughs> that you're learning, Naomi. Oh, I am. I am. We're because we're such a we're such a technologically savvy group. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have no idea cool who else that. might be coming. Um, so I will wait a couple minutes just in case somebody's a couple minutes late. But I think Donna um, Schaefer and Kathy Sands are. I think. You're expecting I'm them? Gil, oh, okay. Gil might even. Good. Yeah, I didn't really ask people to sign up or anything. So, well, we can definitely wait a few minutes. And then the first thing on the agenda is a little um, couple questions and a little icebreaker that Adam Hamilton suggested. So we won't get into the meat okay. for at least five minutes. And we have a 15 minute video that we'll be watching, which you, Naomi, especially will appreciate because he does a quick overview of what's in the chapter. Oh, good, good. So that'll bring you up to speed since you couldn't read it. Yeah, do you have that every week? Yep, yep. Well, good. good. I th well, good I think so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's my, actually, I shouldn't say that. I only watched today's, but. It says in the book that there's a, a video for each session, so. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Oh, there she is. Hi, Michelle. Can you hear us, Michelle? Maybe not. We can hear her, though. You can just say hey, you can speak your hands. Yeah, I do. So that's what I do. I'll wait like one more minute and then we'll just we'll just start and if people come in late that's fine no biggie can you hear me? We now now we can. Yes. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. I yes. can't hear you. Uh, oh no. I can't hear you. We're yes. getting a lot of um, we're getting a lot of background sound from a television or something in your house there too. She can't hear us, so um Hello. I was just going to call you. Can you hear me? We, we can hear you, but there's a lot of um, TV noise or background noise that's just consistently playing. I don't know. Is there something on your in your background on your computer? Um, is it off now? No. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't yes. hear the background noise now. Yes. Yeah, I can't hear anything. No. Tell her to log off. I and had to go in on my back on browser. 
Yeah. Use my uh, Zoom need to be updated or something. Okay. Um, Shoot. So, and now I just can't hear. Is your volume turned on on your computer? Yeah, check yeah. the volume. If not, you might have to log off and log back on. Yeah, if the volume is all the way up. Okay. On the computer yeah, and on the I don't know if I'm going to be able to get back on, but I'll try. Okay, so you can't hear anything on this computer? No. no. All right. Worst comes oh, to worst, my... phone on speaker work. and uh, see if you can hear through that. I could do unclosed um, caption. All the words are coming up now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'll try. Bye-bye. Okay, well, she's gonna come. She's gonna go and come back and see if it works. Sometimes it's funky, and if not, she could stay on the phone with me. Uh, I would popped up a minute or two ago. A participant has enabled closed captioning. Who yeah, can she's, see? The she said she did that so she could at least see the words that we were saying. Michelle said she did that, but who wants to read the whole time? <laughs> it's no fun. We'll just give her a second to try to log back in. Got to turn my hotspot. Oh, there it is. So while we wait for Michelle, I would like to know why you decided to join this Advent study. That's been me. What do you have to hope to get out of it? Uh, maybe a different meaning of Christmas than the traditional every every year. We basically, you know, obviously read through the Gospels. Um, I thought maybe this would give us a little bit of a different uh, look. Look. Okay. There's a Great. saying that I've heard: if you've always done what you always do, you'll always get what you always gotten. So, I think that sums it up. We want to get something different. Do something different. And get something different. There you go. Great. Okay, that makes sense to me. Always learning, trying anyway. Well, Michelle is back, but we can't see her. I don't know if she can hear us or not. I could, I could always call her and put my phone right next to the speaker. If, yeah, if or I was just gonna do that if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, you could do that, Jeff. It, it doesn't matter. See how she's making out. Ask her. Let me call it. Yeah, you just called her, so you might as well call her and find out how she's making out. Hey, Michelle. I was trying to call you. I I can hear, but now oh, I can hear. hear. My, picture's, my picture's not on, but I am here. And I can okay, hear. great. Here, we can hear you on the computer too. Okay, I'll keep working on trying to put my picture on. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. All right. All right. Bye. Oh boy. Okay. Well, we're halfway there. Okay. So this is our icebreaker. It's a quiz. In um. In the first chapter, Adam Hamilton. Um, talked about um, the titles that we use for Jesus being royal titles. And he talked about the 2020 presidential election. So he, he has provided a little quiz for us to see what we remember or know about presidential um, slogans when they were running. So which presidential candidate used this slogan? I'm gonna only give you three of them because there's a long list. Oh, she got her camera to work. Michelle, you are just cooking with gas. 
That's great. Okay, so do you know who used this one? It's Morning in America again. No. I had no idea, and I have the answer. <laughs> no idea. Do you remember, Naomi? No, no, I don't. <laughs> 1984. Well, Ronald that, Reagan. I was talking to Ray, and I wasn't paying attention, uh, asking him what he's doing. Oh, oh, I thought, I thought, I thought you were referring question? to 1920, the uh, 2020 election. That's what I thought, Oh, too. no, no, no. Yes. Past elections. Past okay. elections. Oh. Okay. Historical elections. Vote as you shot. And what was the that question? Was from a while ago. Any ideas? Vote as you shot. Teddy Roosevelt? Hmm? Teddy Roosevelt? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear. Lean toward I the computer. Teddy with a gun. That was a slogan, yeah. She said Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, no, but a good guess. Ulysses S. Grant. Okay. <laughs> okay, oh, one more. Um... Happy days are here again. Nixon. No idea. FDR. Oh, she got it. FDR. Yay. Yay, you win the big prize, which is a smile. Everybody smile at Kathy. Good That's the job. Prize. That's the best prize I could ask for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was our icebreaker. Um, all right, so first question about this study, how is a president like or not like a king? Presidents are generally elected and kings generally either inherit or seize power. Does that seem right? Anybody have anything to add? How are pres How is the president of the United States like a king? Is how are How are presidents similar to or different from kings? So Jeff Jill said presidents are usually elected. Kings, kings are king. Kings are more or less born into the. To mm -hmm. it. Yeah, they can be born into it, or, or they can seize power somehow mm -hmm. yeah yeah does that sound right no. okay what does it mean to call jesus king all powerful all powerful mighty mighty Ruler. Ruling, is that what you said? Yeah. Everyone under the, his wing. The, 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 the Jews. So, sorry, Jeff, Jeff and Kathy were talking at the same herd I time. I heard Kathy say um everyone is under him. And Jeff, what'd you say? Yeah. Uh, wasn't it wasn't it actually the Romans that labeled Jesus the King of the Jews? That's what they put on the cross above his head. But they were basically referred to him as Messiah his whole whole time on earth until the very end, and the and the, the Romans were the ones that kind of labeled him the King of the Jews. Yeah, that's all correct. Yeah. Well, there was a when he was there, and they said, "Are you the King of the Jews?" And he said to them, "So you say I am." Yeah, you say I'm. The you king. say I am. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, can somebody who has their book handy turn to page 17? <clears throat> and read, it's about. The, it's like this the second full paragraph just read starting at this season
This season puts into perspective all our political wrangling. Whatever Christians think about their president and whoever we voted for in the various elections, we are meant to know that there is only one king. It is to him we give our highest allegiance. While our, pol while our politics have divided us, Advent should bring us together, uniting us around the newborn king and his life, message, ministry, death, and resurrection. Thank you. So we are here united, no matter what our political beliefs are, united to learn more about King Jesus. There is a prayer in my leader guide. It's brief. Oh, before I read, before we pray, the book says, that I should tell you that this session will help us to explore both what Jesus's first followers meant when they called him king and how, if at all, calling Jesus king can help us to grow in faith and obedience today. Now let's pray. Let's bow our heads. God most high, who rules over all, you claim and call us all, despite our differences and disagreements, to be your son's followers. May your spirit so fill our minds and hearts in this time of reading and reflection that we understand and embody more fully what it means to praise the King of Kings and Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now let's watch a little video, 15 minutes. <clears throat> You may, you may want to change your view to, um, if you know how to do it, there's a, it's up on the right usually to um, speaker view, and then your whole screen will be filled with the recording. I think it's on. But either way, you could probably see it. I ain't touching nothing. Kathy, can you mute everyone? What's that? Can you mute everyone? I can mute everyone. There we go. Okay. Hi, my name is Adam Hamilton. I'm the author of the book, Incarnation, Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas. I'm also the senior pastor at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in the Kansas City area. And I wanna welcome you to my living room. And as we were preparing these this study and these small group videos, I pictured myself inviting you to come to my home and to sit in my living room as we talk together about the themes and ideas in each of the chapters in the book. Or in my mind, I'm also picturing that I'm sitting in your living room, your Sunday school class or your Bible study group and sharing these things with you. And my hope and prayer is that by the time we're finished with this study, that all of us, I as the author and as the one who's sharing some of these videos and you as the students and participants have grown in your understanding of what Christmas means, what the incarnation means, and what Christ calls and, and asks of us today. So uh, with that in mind, would you bow with me for our opening prayer? Lord, I consider it a privilege to be with these students, these uh, participants in this study, teenagers, adults, who are gathering together 
to try to understand more clearly the significance of the incarnation and the meaning of Christmas for us today. So open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive all that you have for us in this study. Pour out your spirit upon us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I entitled this book Incarnation because this is the central theological affirmation of Christmas, that God came to us, that God took on flesh. You may recognize incarnation, the word carne or meat. God took on meat. He took on flesh in Jesus to walk among us on this earth. We don't believe that, that Jesus just represents God as you or I might represent God, but instead in some mysterious way, God came and walked among us in the flesh. And so what we want to understand is why did that happen? Why did God do this? And then what does that mean for us today? Now, to get at that, what we're going to do is look at the Christmas stories in Matthew and Luke's gospel. You remember Mark doesn't tell the Christmas story, only Matthew and Luke do. So we're going to look at the Christmas stories in Matthew and Luke's gospel. We will look at Mark's introduction to Jesus, but we'll also be looking at John's prologue. So John's magnificent prologue is his telling of the Christmas story in a very different way than Matthew and Luke do. And as we're looking at all of those, what we want to see is what are the names or the titles that the gospel writers gave to Jesus as they're telling the Christmas story. And as we look at those titles, we're going to begin to understand who is Jesus for us today. So each week, we're going to look at different titles. In this first week, we're going to look at the royal titles. We're going to look at Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the King. In the second week, we're going to look at Jesus as Savior. And what does it mean to call him Savior? In the third week, we're going to look at Jesus as Emmanuel. God with us. In the fourth week, we turn to John's gospel, and we'll look at Jesus as the Word made flesh and as the light of the world. And then finally, in the epilogue, we're going to look at Jesus as Lord. And in each one of these, I hope that we grow in our understanding of not only who Jesus is and his significance for our lives, who God his Father is, and also what God asks of us today, because Christmas comes with a mission. And so we're going to hope to discover that mission together as we study this book. So I want to share with you just a little bit about uh, about Christ as Messiah, or Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, or the King. And here I want to turn first to the Gospel of Luke, where we read these words. Uh, this is the uh, the announcement to Mary that she's going to have a child. And the angel Gabriel says, "Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will receive, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David." He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. It's clear from the beginning of the story that Jesus is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the King. All three of these titles, Messiah, Christ, and King, mean much the same thing. Messiah, from the Hebrew, Mashiach, is, uh, is a word that means anointed one. And it could be used of a priest, of a prophet, but it came to, to really signify the kings. So every king was one who was anointed by God, was a Messiah, an anointed one. And, and they were anointed with, with oil by the high priest. That anointing oil was a special anointing oil. And the, and the significance of this was that they were set apart by God. In the anointing, God was saying, you belong to me, and I'm setting you apart for my holy purposes. And as God set those kings apart, they were to rule on God's behalf. Now, Jesus is called the Messiah, or in Greek, the word is Christos, or Christ. He is the Messiah or the Christ. He is God's anointed one, set apart to rule on God's behalf. My Jewish friends have a blessing that they say as they speak to God. And, and the blessing goes like this, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melch Ha Olam, which means blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. God is the King of the universe. He rules over everything. He is the rightful owner of everything, the creator of all things. And Jesus came to incarnate his reign, to show us who our King is, what our King is like, and to call us to follow him. The central focus of Jesus' preaching and teaching is the kingdom of God is at hand. He teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Jesus is our king, and he reigns on behalf of, he rules on behalf of his father, who is king of the universe. Almost all the Christmas carols point to this identity or this idea of Jesus as king. And so I remember these words and what child is this when we sing this, this is Christ the king, whom shepherds guard and angels sing, haste, haste to bring him laud the babe, the son of Mary. Or in Joy to the World, we sing, Joy to the World, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. That's interesting to me that Advent, and, and I mentioned this in the book, that Advent falls three weeks after election day, roughly three weeks after the uh, election day, in which we elect federal officials. Every other year, we're electing uh, Congress members, and uh, every fourth year, we're electing the President of the United States along with members of Congress. And as we're doing that, uh, and the year that I'm filming this is an election year. It's a year in which we're fighting the divide 
among human beings, our family members divided over whether we like the current president or we wish for another president. I was just reading on Facebook among some of my family members who are deeply divided over, over who should be the next president of the United States. And, and in the middle of this, you know, sometimes mudslinging and name calling, and there's just this, this, this tear of the, of the, uh, of the scab off the wound of our collective soul as a nation as we're deciding who we're going to elect as president. But three weeks after we've elected that person, we move into the season of Advent. And in this time, we remember that while we may elect presidents, we choose to follow only one king. We who are Christians, whether we're Republicans or Democrats, Libertarians or Independents, we have but one king. And there is one kingdom that matters most. And so regardless of who you voted for, I remind you that our primary allegiance, our highest allegiance, goes to Christ, our king. So as we ponder these things, I want to remind you of the kind of king that Jesus is. And as you're as you're studying the book, I want you to think together as you think about our political candidates. And I don't want you to get into a debate about politics. But as we think about all of our political candidates, it doesn't matter which party you're talking about. None of them come close to, none of them really truly capture who Jesus is as our king. None of them deserve the kind of allegiance that we give to him. When we look at Jesus, we compare him to our earthly rulers, right? The people that we elect as uh, as members of Congress and as our president. And when we look at them, we measure them against Jesus. So I think about Jesus. He was a king who had compassion on his subjects. He healed them. He fed them. He forgave them. He taught them. He cared for them. He modeled for them what it means to be human. He ultimately suffers and dies for them. He demonstrates to us sacrificial love that we might understand what it means to be human. Part of what I long for in our presidents, part of what I long for in members of Congress, is that they would model for us what it means to be citizens of the United States, what is best in our country. And they might show us that. When I look to Jesus, I see what it means to be a human being and what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. So allow me to tell you just a little bit about that king, that king that I serve, that you serve, that we seek to serve together in his kingdom. So there was a very famous preacher. His name was S.M. Lockridge, Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. He, uh, he preached a sermon in the 1970s. It was called That's My King. And on the bottom of the screen, you're going to find the web address where you can see just a short portion of this. I wanted to include it in this video, but there just was not a way to do that with copyright. So I'm going to encourage you somewhere during your lesson to actually bring it up online and to watch this, this short portion of the sermon. The sermon in total was about an hour and five minutes long, but this is about a three or four minute clip. But I want to read to you just a few portions of what he said in, in that powerful rhetorical voice and, and, the, and the rhythm and the cadence that he had. He says, let me tell you about my king. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. I wonder if you know him. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and he sustains. He guards and he guides. I wish I could describe it to you, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, Herod couldn't kill him, death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah, that's my king. That's our king. That's the king that we hail, whose birth we celebrate at Christmas. Now, God never forces us to, to honor him or to hail him as king. Jesus didn't either. Jesus came inviting people to follow. They could choose to follow or reject him. When we follow him, when we hail him as our king, we offer our lives to him. We say to him, you are my king, you are my Christ, and I'm here to do your will, to go where you want me to go, to do what you want me to do. For me, that begins every single morning. I get on my knees and I say, Jesus, you are my king. Help me to pay attention. Help me to listen for your guiding hand. Use me however you will. Help me to live my life in a way that honors you and pleases you. You are my king. That's the prayer that I would hope you would pray every single morning, that we offer our lives to him as our king. We yield ourselves to him for his purposes. And that leads me to the closing in chapter one. One of the things I enjoy in producing these videos is the chance to show you things that I can only talk about in the book. And I closed chapter one by talking about a woman named Nancy Brown. And this is a photo of Nancy. She was a founding member of Church of the Resurrection. She was there for 29 years, almost 30 years. Uh, she was a force for the kingdom of God. And she was one of those kind of people that, uh, that just stays on you until you do what she's hoping you'll do. She had this passion for Africa, and she desperately wanted me to go to Africa. And I, I had seen the pictures. I'd heard the stories. I'd met pastors and, and people from Africa. I wanted to be a part of our mission there in Malawi, in the country of Malawi, and in, in South Africa, and, and uh, to be involved in Zambia and Zimbabwe and these other places. 
but I just didn't think I had the time to go. And she's like, you have to go, you have to go, you have to go until I finally, she wore me down and I got on a plane and I went 24 hours it took us to get there and uh, spent a week there with her the first time and then went back again and again with her and had a chance to watch the way that she impacted people in that part of the world. And not just in Africa. I mean, she came alongside as a servant, you know, to, to see what were the needs and how can we help and what can we do in this country? Now, the reason why she did this, going back again and again, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen, maybe three dozen times she was in Africa. Even the year she was dying, she went back to Africa one more time. It was because Christ was her king. And she felt him calling her to go and to come alongside the people there and to see what can we do to stand with you and to help people in Africa to experience the love of Christ and to address the very real felt needs, the very real physical needs of people who are living in abject poverty. I love that about Nancy. She was a force for the kingdom of God. A year before Nancy died, I was preaching a sermon on suffering and how we as Christians face suffering. She already knew that she was battling terminal cancer, that she was not going to survive this battle. And I wanted you to hear just a few words from this amazing woman. Take a listen. I don't recall many times um, in, during adversity that uh, I have not found something to be thankful about. Does that mean I'm grateful? Because I have cancer now, uh, I'm not grateful I have cancer, but I am grateful for the opportunities that have come alongside of cancer. You can be even grateful for to people, certainly for the things that they've done, but I'm grateful to God for the life that I've lived, and and that's even better. I mean, I think there's there's a spiritual component, there's a human component about gratitude, and I'm just so grateful that I've had a life of faith that I can have that. I can't imagine how people can go through adversity without a life of faith. I can go and say, oh, woe is me. I mean, I fully expected to live till I was 100. Well, I'm not going to live till I'm 100. Um, now, I could sit there and say, well, I deserve those extra 25 years. Or I can say, wow, I lived 75 great years. And I decided to say, I've lived 75 great years because I have. Um, and I'm grateful for those 75 years. I think my grandchildren and, and, and even my family and people around me, if they've learned one thing from, from me and my life, I really hope it's the idea that um, adversity happens to everybody. And it's how you respond to that adversity that really separates you from other people. My hope is that you might have that same kind of faith and that together we might live as those who seek to follow Jesus as our king. Now I want to end with this. I, I think about the divisions in our country and how Christ can unite us and bring us together. And I missed this quote in, in the book, but I'd like to read it here. John Wesley, speaking about the divisions in his own world, said this, would to God that all the party names and unscriptural phrases and forms which have divided the Christian world were for God. And that we might all agree to sit down together as humble, loving disciples at the feet of our common master, to hear his word, to imbibe his spirit, and to transcribe his life in our own. My hope and prayer is that during the season of Advent, as we hail Christ as our King, we might find that we are brought together at the feet of Jesus, and that we imbibe his spirit and his words, and they shape our own. Let's pray together. Lord, bless these as they discuss this chapter. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them, and help us that as we read the Gospels and reflect upon your glory, we might say with S.M. Lockridge, Yes, that's my king. Amen. I'm going to my office. This speech by S.M. Lockridge. This sermon, it's only three minutes. You should really listen to it. It is, it is good. <laughs> you were supposed to be paying attention to Adam. Oh, I was, I was, but I thought, well, let me just see how long it is. And it's only three minutes. It's, it's very good. Yes. So I, I was thinking um, we can listen to it at the end. If we, because we only have a half an hour if we're going to stick to the 730 stopping point. I also could email you the link. It's, it is very easy to find though. Okay, so moving right along. Uh, my leader guide.
Do you have any comments about the video before I ask you some questions? Okay. Adam Hamilton thinks Advent should be a season of unity for Christians. Do you or have you experienced Advent in that way? As a season of uni unity. I, I kind of do. Um, I think sometimes even people that aren't really Christian, uh, sometimes during Christmas and during Easter, they they do show signs of Christianity. Um, and, and during Christmas, probably especially, there's probably more programs that have a Christian type background for helping others and giving to others that don't happen th throughout the rest of the year. You watch my homework. I do. Other comments? Naomi is muted and she's trying to talk. Here she goes. Oh, no. Am I on now? There you go. Yep, we can hear you now. Why, why did that do that? I didn't touch anything. I did it. I muted everybody when we were listening oh, to that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot. And we're Sorry supposed about to unmute. <clears throat> Only if you want to be heard. I just said music means more to me during Easter and Christmas. Uh, the songs bring me closer to that season, you know, that just. That's me, you know, my music. And would you agree that Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Pentecostals, we probably all know a lot of the same Christmas carols? Oh, probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that is it's unifying. Universal, sort of. I don't know. Mm -hmm. well not unifying for christians okay yeah hamilton reflected on the royal titles bestowed on jesus in the new testament in the advent and christmas stories what do you think of when you think about royalty do you think of jesus as royalty so in general what do you think about royalty and how about Jesus? I I think of Jesus as a different type of royalty. It, it's mm -hmm. it's a step above royalty. Um, to me, royalty is not always an honorable position. It's it's a it's a gifted position where. Jesus and God are, are divine, I guess, would be more of a word to describe it to me. So it's hard to compare any human being yeah, to Jesus. I think Jesus you should have a better word. Mm -hmm. What's that? Michelle, what'd you say? I think they should have a better word than royalty. <laughs> They are better than that. <laughs> I just yeah. don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't think of Jesus, and, Jesus and God <laughs> as royalty. I don't think of them as that. If you were to ask me real quickly, the first thing that popped into my mind is, is going to be um, all the kings of England and uh, Queen Elizabeth, and and now King Charles, and uh, <laughs> um, when I think of royalty. Mm -hmm. 
Me too. That's why I think of royalty. Yeah. Yeah. I I I agree with Jeff in that um, Jesus in God is above royalty. There should be some super royalty classification. Messiah. Uh, well, that means the anointed one and... Uh, it does, and he points out in the book that the kings and queens of England are anointed, but that is correct. Yes, we don't the call Canterbury, them, but, but we don't uh, call them Messiah. Correct. <laughs> yes. Yes. Or yeah. savior. Or savior. Right. Exactly. So we do have words. I would say, um, even though I know that Messiah means anointed, I learned that in seminary. I, when I think, when I say Messiah, I think more about savior than about king, I guess. So we need to hold both of those, our king, our savior. So can you think of any rituals in either society or the church where people are set aside in a ceremony where something is done, a ceremony is done and the person is set aside <clears throat> for a special purpose, some sort of special purpose. A baptism. Baptism. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the white coat ceremony? No. <clears throat> he mentioned he mentions it in the book, and I'm familiar with it because it's what we do with the first year medical students. Oh, yes. First year medical students, it, it's a way to remind them of the responsibility of being a physician that they're not like everybody else anymore. Once they start to care for patients, they have to behave in a different way. It Historically, doctors and priests were actually one physician. Um, it's over time that they've been separated into two different professions, but the white coat ceremony is a is a way of setting them apart and reminding them that they have a, a privilege and a responsibility as doctors once they become doctors. Have are you aware that when um, pastors become elders or deacons, well, pastor candidates become elders or deacons? that they are anointed during ordination? With oil or water? <clears throat> with oil. They're anointed with holy oil. Hmm. And the bishop lays hands on the candidates and prays over them and tells them and the audience that they are now set apart as servants of God, that they belong to God and are set apart. I was not ordained, so that didn't happen with me. I have, I just have a license to be a pastor. So those sorts of ceremonies are still done. Um, so Adam Hamilton talked about Christ being like Christus, which is Greek, and Mashiach being Hebrew, and that they both mean Messiah. They mean anointed one. So Christ is not Jesus's last name. It means G it's Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed one, or Jesus the Messiah. 
Christus and Messiah have the same meaning of anointed one. And it's another way of saying king. So um, if you are willing, actually, I'm going to ask you to make a choice because there's still a lot. There's a couple of three sections yet. So we, we only have 15 minutes if we're going to finish at 730. So we can either look at 2 Samuel 7, which talks about King David, or we can look at the prophets, which talk about the coming Messiah, or we can look at Luke at the angel Gabriel's words to Mary, or we can go longer. It's up to you. So who, so you have three choices, four choices, King David, the prophets, or the angel Gabriel talking to Mary, or go until quarter to eight and do two out of the three. So who votes for Samuel and King David? Raise your hand. doesn't matter to me whatever who votes for the prophets isaiah jeremiah and ezekiel no votes who votes for the angel gabriel and mary two votes who votes for going until quarter to eight one vote two votes three votes four votes okay so I think we can do two of them. Um, I'm going to skip to the prophets and we'll do the angel Gabriel. Let's do that. Okay. So uh, please, if you would, uh, let's see, there are one, two, three, four, five of you who can read. Naomi can listen. So two people um, can look up Isaiah one can look up Jeremiah and one can look up Ezekiel. Who would like to look up Isaiah? Jeff and Jill, do you want to look up Isaiah? Bible. Oh, Kathy Goringer, you're going to look up Isaiah. Uh, do you want it? Do you want the Isaiah passage out of the book or the Bible? Isaiah nine two through seven. Oh yes, that's right here. In, uh, oh two through right seven. There. They have, two well, through he seven. has he has six through seven. Okay. I have my I have my Bible here. Okay. Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. Somebody look up Jeremiah 23, 1 through 8. I got Jeremiah. Somebody, somebody look up Ezekiel 34. We heard this last week. What? Ezekiel 34, 23 to 31. I can do that. Once, once you get that, once you find the, the book, I'll remind you of the verses. Have the book, Jeremiah what? Jeremiah 23, 1 to 8. Okay, I have that. Michelle, what have you got? I don't have my Bible downstairs with me. Oh, okay. No worries. I have a I, just bought, I only bought this book down with me. Okay. I, I can read Isaiah in here is in this book. Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. It's not quite all of it. That's okay. Okay. I can go, I can go Isaiah to where, and then Michelle can pick up, pick up the end. And then I'll, I'll jump to Ezekiel if you want. Perfect. That'd be great. Okay. So Michelle, keep um, Isaiah six and seven there. Kathy, what the, what's the, what's the Ezekiel passage? Ezekiel 34, 23 to 31. 34 to 41. 31 23 to 31 okay okay so okay. Kathy, you start us off with isaiah 9 2 to 5 right and then michelle can read 6 and 7 from the book 
Um, and this is Isaiah talking about um, there will be no more gloom for those in distress and what have you. Uh, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Median's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authorities rest upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom, he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. For this time onward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Great. Jeremiah 23, 1 to 8. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnants of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pastures where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them. They will no longer be afraid or terrified nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous savior. So when the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the descendants of Israel up from the land of the north, out of all the countries where he had banished them, then they will live in their own land. Thank you. Ezekiel 34, 23 to 31. I will place over them one shepherd, my shepherd David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. The Lord have, the Lord have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of savage beasts so that they may live in the wilderness and sleep in the forests in safety. I will make them and the places surrounding my hill a blessing. I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. The trees will yield their fruit and the ground will yield its crops. The people will be secure in their land. They will know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hands of those who enslave them. They will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety, and no one will make them afraid. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land of bear, in the, in the land or bear the score of the nations. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with, am with them, and that they, the Israelites, are my people, declares the Sovereign Lord. Thank you all. So these passages and the pas passage from Second Samuel, when God 
said to King David, you, your family, your line will reign forever and will not end. All of those have given Israel this idea of and the, the what they call the messianic hope that they're waiting for the messiah waiting for the ideal king like david to come and save them so when you hear those passages that that you just read from isaiah jeremiah and ezekiel what pops out as like the description of this messianic hope this hoped for king either what the king will be like or what life will be like once this king comes what did you hear in those in those passages from the prophets i heard um them pro prophetically saying that the coming messiah the coming king is going to teach us how to live righteously again and to 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 know what's right and to live and to yeah and what else it's somebody else everyone will be together as one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from mighty all the nations great. yeah michelle mighty and great it'll be great mm -hmm. mighty and great Mighty and great. Mighty yeah. And great. yeah. Mm -hmm. Naomi, did anything pop out for you? Under what they all said. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And Kathy? The great safety. The flock is safety under one, under one uh, large encompassing shepherd. Um, that will protect us and mm -hmm. uh, lead us to goodness and and kindness and take away all worries. Yeah. What yeah. a dream. I was, about, I was just going <laughs> to say that, take away all worries, yeah. Takes, <clears throat> sounds great, doesn't it? Yes, doesn't like, it? The end of, like the end of Revelation. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, exactly. And Revelation is talking about all these things finally happening for good for good yeah yeah ah huh, such a dream <laughs> so then we come to luke 1 luke 1 26 to 38 and please if you don't mind we are going to read it like a play so we need someone to, to read parts of Mary and someone to read Gabriel. Somebody gets to be the angel and somebody gets to be the narrator. Neat. Luke 1, 26. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the audience. <laughs> okay. okay. Naomi will be the audience. So you get to, to, to do like, ooh, <gasps> <gasps> <laughs> you get to react to the story luke 1 tw beginning at 26 so the, the beginning part is the narrator so we need a narrator would you say michelle i could read 30 i could read 30 to 33 whatever that that part is that the that's the angel let's say is that part in the book is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, not be afraid, Mary. Yeah, that's the angel Gabriel. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so well, I could be the narrator. Okay. Jeff will be the narrator. There's one <laughs> other little part that Gabriel says. I'll say that, Michelle, because you won't have it. And then you can start at 30 to 33. And then who wants to be the Virgin Mary? Yeah, I am in Luke 1. Verse 26. But it's the birth of, oh, 26. No wonder I'm not in the right place. <laughs> oh, gosh, I guess I'll be Mary. Okay. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> be Mary. And 
Thank you, Mother not, Mary. Not qualified, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, narrator. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Go ahead, Michelle. The angel said, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give you give him to you the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. How can this be, since I am a virgin? Oh, and then the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel left her. And the angel left. Okay. Well done. How do Gabriel's words about Jesus echo the ancient messianic hopes? That he would be on the throne. Yes, he will be on the throne. And read um, verse 32 there, the whole thing. He will be a, he will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. Right. So that's the messianic hope. A descendant of King David, who will be a great king, will reign. How do you imagine Mary felt about those words? She was a devout young Jewish girl, really. A young, very young woman. How do you think she, she felt? How would you feel? Scared, overwhelmed. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had plans. I'm a, I'm a virgin. What are you <laughs> talking about? What was my, what was my I'm, I'm betrothed? How, what? What did this be? They'll string them up. Yeah, they're going to stone me. They're going to stone me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know I would have said. No, no, no. This is not part of my plan. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've said that to Jesus, to Jesus many times. But um, Mary was <laughs> much, much better and more devout than I was. A very amazing woman. Based on our discussion so far of Messianic hope and what you know of Jesus's ministry, why did Jesus's followers believe that he had fulfilled their hope for a Messiah? Because he healed people. 
he healed people. Yeah. What else did he do? Anything else? Messianic. His lineage, his lineage was there. Yeah. Was that all encompassing shepherd that people just flocked to him? And he talked about love and peace and the goodness to come. Um, maybe not tomorrow, but there will be a great heaven uh, to come to these Someday. followers. Yep. Someday. Yeah, all that. And he was able to unite people. I mean, thousands and thousands of people came just to listen to him speak. So. Yeah. Something about that guy. Adam Hamilton describes Jesus's public ministry as his campaign for the office of king. What did you think about that? He was on the road. He was doing speeches. Hmm. And James and John wanted to know if they could be his right-hand guys when he came to power. Yeah. Vice president, speaker of the house. Yeah. Does it does it seem sort of like it fits? But Jesus said, as Jeff said earlier, you say I'm king. I don't think Jesus Because he knew there was somebody even above him. But that, do we call him king? Uh, yes, we do. But your question was, what did he, what, what, what your question was, Jesus, did Jesus see himself as king, as a campaigner? No, do you find, do, what do you think of the, I, that metaphor, the idea of, you know, his, the way that he was doing public mis ministry, was it sort of like a campaign for the office of king or is that not appropriate? I don't think he would have liked the word campaigning, but um, he was doing God's work. I mean, he, he, he knew in the garden of Gethsemane that, that, that he's, I mean, he, 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 his tears of, of that he cried and that he knew he was doing God's work. So, um, uh, yeah, I think he, he, he knew what he had to do. Um, and I don't think he was campaigning. He was just speaking the words that God put into his mouth. His father put into his mouth. So you don't like the metaphor? No. I, I don't. Real, realistically speaking, no, but metaphorically speaking, yes. Metaphorically speaking, his yes. His intention wasn't to campaign, but you can he compare it. He wasn't campaigning, per se, you but can compare metaphor it, metaphorically speaking, yes, you could say. There are some parallels. Campaign. It was a campaign He's to bring. Campaigning for God. There were, there were some parallels. He was campaigning for God. Yeah, in yeah. some ways. Now, so if you, if, you accept that, if you accept that there were some parallels, think about how different and adam hamilton talks about this how it wasn't like the campaigns that politicians do right he wasn't right, he was like telling people i'm gonna lower your taxes or <laughs> i'm gonna you know Why? build more what? bridges or i don't think he said too many lies exactly there you go yeah he didn't lie and did he tell people, um, you know, that he would make them richer? No. No. Spiritually. Spiritually, yeah. yes. Yes. In fact, he said, get rid of all your money. Treasures in heaven, 
not on yeah, Earth. I told people that if you follow me, you you will become poor. You will give up everything you you have and follow me. Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you carry the cross that I carry? Is what he said to his disciples, and they had no idea what he was talking about. They really didn't get it. So, no. Luke 7, 36 to 50. is one of the examples the gospels have different examples of anointing luke 7 36 to 50 is one of them thirty six to 50 it's pretty long um let's say if you've got your bible read uh four verses somebody start us off read 36 37, 38, 39, and then say another person's name and they can read four verses and we'll do 36 to 50. And Michelle doesn't have her Bible, so skip Michelle. I'll start. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, this is Jesus anointed by a sinful woman in my book, in my Bible anyway. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Next. You have to name it, Kathy. Oh, uh, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> Then, what, what? where am I reading? 40. 40. 40. To what? Uh, 44. 44. Okay. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she, was, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Jill. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. How does this scripture about Jesus's anointing show that Jesus show what Jesus thought it meant to be king? How does this passage show what Jesus thought it meant to be king. Hmm. 
that everybody is forgiven. Yeah. That he loves everyone. Just, you know, we all make mistakes and live different ways. And he uses his power as king not to make people do things, not to build armies, not to conquer, but to love and forgive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Different kind of king. Yeah, I don't think I would have gotten too much king out of that passage. It, it's I the, would have gotten a lot of forgiveness. It's and, the anointing. The mm -hmm. anointing. Oh, oh. Well, yeah. From the, because of the anointing. Yeah. So certain things happened before Jesus was crucified that are ceremonial things that happen when someone becomes king. They just didn't happen the way they usually do. So he was anointed oh, in this yes. passage. He was anointed. It's the story. There's a very similar story, but slightly different in the other books um, Adam Hamilton supposes, and my professors at Drew also suppose that people remembered what happened differently. They heard different stories. And so they wrote it down slightly different versions. Um, so he was anointed, which a king always is anointed, and he was crowned. He was lifted up. Usually they're lifted up on a big high chair. He was lifted up on a cross and he was crowned with a crown of thorns. So my cross, cross reference for that uh, says it comes from Psalm 23, five, where you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil. Yeah. Which There's was, so the, which me. was the ceremonial indication that someone was a king. Yep. Which is part of the, still is part of the ceremony. Okay, so how did Jesus's resurrection on Easter confirm his status as king for his followers? Or vice versa? If he had stayed dead, would he have seemed like an all-powerful king? No. So they thought that they were wrong when he was crucified. That's why they all ran away. They thought, oh man, we really picked a winner here. He's not the Messiah. He's dead. We were wrong and they were petrified and they ran away. And then he rose from the dead and they said, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Now we get it. Cool. Didn't they say that, say that if uh, you are the king, save yourself. And yeah. he didn't. So. And he didn't, but he did. Yes. It just took a couple of days. It just took a little while. Good things come to those who wait. Yes. <laughs> All right. It's actually already 10 of 8. So um, we should wrap this up. And uh, the last question is about, the last two questions are about the book of Revelation which we just finished studying and the triumphant return of Jesus as King. And you're very familiar with it. So we, you, we, are, we have that picture now in our minds of Jesus as the King. We just have to be patient and faithful until it happens. Soon. Soon. Very soon. Oh. Okay. Um, let me see. 
I am asked to invite you to think over the next week about a way that you could witness to Jesus's rule. One thing that you could do during the Advent season to show that Jesus is your king. Think about that. Think about maybe things that you traditionally do at this time of year that show that you are devoted to Jesus and maybe something new that you could do to show the world that Jesus is your king. And I have a prayer for you to close us out. Let's pray. Eternal God, through the ages, your people have longed for a righteous ruler who will speed up the day your will is finally done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus, your anointed one, you anointed us to do your will as citizens of your kingdom. By your spirit, keep us strong and hopeful as his faithful and obedient subjects. Amen. Amen. So during the, the next several weeks, as we sing Christmas songs, think about the, all those references to anointing and king, because there are quite a few. All righty. Thank you. Um, if you if it was too much and you want us to make sure we finish by 730, send me a little note. And um and I will go through and take out a couple chunks to shorten it up. Okay? Okay. Because I don't like yeah. to break my promises. It's all good. It's all good. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop that. recording. Hmm? What was that? I'm fine with the way we're, you know, the over. You're okay with it? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Bye. Have a good night. You too. Bye. 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 See you Sunday. See you Sunday. Yep. Oh, you Sunday. I'm going to be at the road to Bethlehem tomorrow, hopefully. Oh, yeah. See you tomorrow. Yep. Oh, yeah. pray Just pray rain. that the rain stops. Oh. Yes. All right. Bye, gang. Bye. Bye. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.